if you're watching this on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, which everyone should go check out, they have not checked it already, you will tell that I am recording this in a slightly dingy hotel in Miami. We've been talking about this for weeks, if not months, but Sagar and I are in town for the realignment conference and broader programming that we're putting on this week. It's been really exciting. I love being in Miami. We've met a bunch of realignment listeners that a few of you actually heard of because they submitted really great questions. It's a huge privilege to be here. Definitely hit me up on Twitter or at the realignment email, realignmentpod at gmail.com. If you're in town and want to meet up, hang out, whatever, mostly free, really excited to do it. Today's episode is continuing our tradition and really our focus this last part of the season of speaking to voices that frankly are pretty mainstream, voices of people who hold either centrist or center left or elite views, who at the same time are interested in speaking to the audience and the community that really that we are really building here. And that's really important to me. There's been an interesting discourse that I'm going to write about in the Substack today around the type of guests that we bring on. There's been a little mild pushback from people who have later said, hey, you know what? We have been booking too many establishment or elite guests. And today's guest, Ronald Daniels, who's actually the president of Johns Hopkins University, one of the best schools in the country, easily qualifies as part of that elite. We're always going to be a show that's receptive and wants to speak to the type of people who you want to speak with. At the same time, something I've been thinking a lot about as I think about who we're booking in the conversations we're having, what the actual purpose of these conversations are, is the realignment is how Sagar and I think about the world. And I hope it's a place that helps you all think about the world too. The more we do these episodes, the clearer it becomes that there are few, if any, people who have a great read on what's happening in the country and the world right now. There are few, if any, people who have an ability to think through the problems that we're facing right now. And if we're thinking of the ways this show is a better show than it was during our first and probably a decent part of our second season, it's the recognition from two of our perspective that we have not figured it out either. So when we have these episodes, whether it's on the realignment or the or breaking points where we talk about, hey, what's happening with young men dropping out of college more? Why aren't the student loan problems getting resolved at the right rate. It's actually really helpful and really interesting to me to bring up those conversations with the leader of a top tier university in this country. Even if you're a populist, even if you're anti-institutional, if you think all this is corrupt, it's really useful for us to get the chance to push and focus on those topics. So it was really great that I got an hour of Ron's time. And I think there's a lot of useful things here. His book that we're talking about today is called What Universities Owe Democracy. And there's really a lot here. I suggest that everyone take a look at it. As I mentioned, it's a lot of great writing in the Atlantic and Washington Post. And once again, I'll close up by just reminding everyone, we're going to be a place where you and other people and our guests can come to think about things. And this was productive and we're going to keep doing it. That being said, as we're coming out of this crazy conference planning week, knock on wood, we'll finally be done as of Friday send us an email. Let us know who we should bring on the show. We're going to do a lot of long-term show planning, how we can fit all this together, how we can get the show's editorial points. It's really, really, really important to us. So even if this isn't quite your cup of tea and this isn't the, issue, the episode you're interested in, no worries. Come back next time. We definitely don't program this show in a way that every single guest is going to meet every single one of your interests every single time. So as always, thank you for checking in. A couple of quick notes before the episode starts. Number one, be sure to check out our Substack. It is in the show notes. It goes out later today, Eastern Standard Time in the afternoon. Ron's book is available at our bookshop along with other books that we've been published. So you can go there and help support the show. Of course, huge thank you to our sponsors for supporting everything we're doing. We're really excited to be here. Let's get into the episode. Daniels, welcome to The Realignment. Delighted to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to speak with you because in these conversations about the future of higher education, usually it's a bit pundity 
but you actually lead an institution of higher education. So there's some degree of stake here. So I really appreciate the chance to speak with you about your book. Let's start with the following. The key thing that goes throughout your book, your writing at the Atlantic and Washington Post, and just your general discourse on this topic is your deep focus on institutions. And You know this because you cover the space, the broad story of American life and probably the broader industrialized world is that since roughly the 1970s, you've just seen a complete collapse in faith and trust in any type of institution, whether it's higher education, media, political parties, government, basically anything you could possibly imagine. So let's just start off really simply. Why is that? So, um, you know, I think you can look at a number of different factors that explain the shift in trust in institutions. Uh, One can argue that uh, we're caught in the maw of a broader set of uh, trends that have affected people's confidence uh, in institutions, Um, you know, that, you know, to the extent that uh, one can argue that uh, we have become sites of deep politicization and in some sense have echoed and reflected broader trends in our society. No doubt that's part of the story. Um, But, you know, what I have tried to do in this book is first and foremost to take institutions seriously and to take the institution that is the university seriously and to say um, uh, uh, if we are able to um, map out the ways in which the university contributes to democracy, is there more that we can be doing to strengthen our institution in this moment? So that um, at, a, at a very basic level, I, th- I do have a deep faith in institutions, not just in this institution, but indeed in others. And it's my hope that in this book, I'm able to look critically uh, at the institution and at the end of the day, be hopeful about its capacity for reform and evolution to uh, respond to the challenges of the moment. Yeah, you said something interesting, especially regarding the broader trends that I want to pull into specifically in the higher education context. So trust could come at different angles, and I'm being a bit of an audience advocate here. One could say that leaders in higher education like yourself are subject to broader societal forces. The costs of all sorts of services, especially public-facing ones, whether it's healthcare, higher education itself, that is clearly a broader trend that is not the personal fault of any one specific leader or even institution. At the other end, though, there are examples that you, of course, get into where leaders and institutions either didn't step up to the plate properly, didn't conceive of their roles in society the right way. So how, as you're thinking about this, especially in your field of higher education, how do you balance out the what are folks in your position responsible for when it comes to a lot of the younger part of our audience's probable lack of faith in the institution. And then what's just a broader thing that you don't control? I'm not going to blame you for Balmore's cost disease, which is basically the idea that in certain sectors of the economy, costs have gone up. Right. So I think, you know, it is a responsibility of leadership to first and foremost ask, what is the essential role played by your institution and how Um, particularly for uh, institutions that are public facing and indeed are imbued with a public role. How do you best serve the public wheel? And for me, um, and as I argue, as you know, in the book, I have a very clear sense of the ways in which the university contributes to democracy and to the public wheel more generally. And I talk about the extent to which we're sites for social mobility, that we achieve the promise of equal opportunity in the country. Um, I talk about the role that we play in truth and fact-checking and can hold power to account. Um, And I talk about the role that we can play in terms of educating people for their democratic responsibilities. And finally, how we have become very interesting places that are much more diverse, more pluralistic than they certainly were several decades ago. And how given that broad constellation 
and of ideas, of convictions, of different racial, religious backgrounds, uh, uh, socioeconomic backgrounds, how we can model the best of pluralism. So in, in, in all these respects, I think it starts as leaders saying, this is what your institution um, is supposed to do in this moment. Um, it may be at times uh, hard to be able to address the broader societal trends that are buffeting the institution. But ultimately, I'm optimistic because I've seen it so many times in the past where uh, leadership is able to take on uh, issues to put stake and ground on important points of principle and to move the institution along and not simply be a recipient of those broader trends. And um, and I don't think that's quixotic. I really do think that we have the capacity to be able within our um, incredibly rich and complicated communities to be able to have some sense of more than simply pass reacting passively to the forces around us. You know, in any given case, any given issue that comes your way, you know, you're always thinking about how you best uh, husband your political capital and what issues you think you can have traction on and which issues you know um, you're like not likely to have the kind of impact you're like. Um, but having said that, I don't think that we're just mere administrators. We're we're not just um, we're not just um, occupants of an office where you are just look to to administer an institution. You're there to lead it. And in that respect, um, I think you do have the capacity to make change. And we'll get to the questions of pluralism and civics a little later in the conversation, but something I'm curious about, and this is interesting not merely because you are you know, the leader of a university, but because you're actually Canadian. So I'm asking you to, for a certain degree, to interpret American society, um, it, both inside and outside. Why do you think so much of American politics has polarized around educational lines in a way that wasn't true 20, 30, 40 years ago? Because as we're getting to the conversation about pluralism, this seems to be the starting point of where these issues of trust and civic engagement has to begin with. So I think um, there's, there's, there's probably a number of different factors at play here. And there's others who have spent much more time than I have um, on exploring these issues. But I would say, you know, at one level, um, to the extent that um, we have seen uh, clear trends towards deepening levels of inequality in the country, and in particular, over the last several years, reduced social mobility, um, I think that can't help but in turn be turned on the university as, um, as at least a question of whether we are exacerbating or ameliorating those trends, because we know how powerful the university is in allowing people to um, achieve remarkable levels of social mobility um, by virtue of the human capital they're able to develop while in the university. And so at, uh, at one level, I think that the, um, uh, that the faith in our institutions has suffered a bit uh, because of just the broader awareness of, in American society that it's just harder to get ahead. And there's a lot of, you know, there's a, there are a lot of impediments and, and the university uh, plays a role in that um, to the extent that uh, we fail to model effectively the Jeffersonian ideal of equal opportunity and taking the most meritorious and 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 um, and uh, to and to uh, and to giving them the opportunity for advancement. I guess at another level, um, there's no question that universities, by virtue of um, of of the commitment to debate and to dissent. Um, to development of new perspectives and critiques on society, we are essentially sites of controversy. And I think there is a trend uh, that has, you know, that, that at least as long as I've been in America, I've seen where the universities, uh, where events on the university campus often become uh, stories, become, um, become, 
um, places or, or moments where broader themes about what is what is challenging America get played out. And so, um, and so I think that's another reason why um, in some quarters, uh, the kind of ideas, the critiques that are being developed here, I think again get shrouded in this broader controversy. Um, so I, you know, I think I think those factors are at play. And then, you know, just generally, we've known across a host of different American institutions, there is just a growing distrust and skepticism of expertise. And maybe some of that is well founded. That um, that um, that you. Um, shouldn't just blindly follow those who proclaim expertise. It has to be earned and substantiated. Um, but nevertheless, I think that too contributes to the, uh, uh, the skepticism and the concern about, um, about our institutions. You know, I'm glad you brought up the expertise dynamic there, because, you know, as you referenced with your point about the Jeffersonian faith in meritocracy, or at least the 18th century version thereof, a lot of caveats have to be put in the place there, obviously. But, you know, another another tendency in America is the, the Jacksonian um, instinct, which is that that skepticism of expertise, the skepticism that in many ways is well-deserved and is a, is a natural outgrowth of any democratic process. So given your point you just made about expertise, how do you think any institution which places a lot of its emphasis, especially Johns Hopkins, which has a huge amount of research work, a lot of medical work, obviously, specifically as relates to COVID, how do you balance both the, the Jeffersonian, but with the Jacksonian, and then, and then, frankly, just with the fact that these are institutions that are broadly, especially if they're private, like as yours is operating outside of like the public's direct grasp. There's just a bit of tension there. And I'm just curious how you think about that. So, you know, I think it comes first and foremost with an understanding that whether you are a private or a public university in this country, you know, ultimately you are imbued with a public role and responsibility, you know, just at one very basic level. Uh, um, although we are seen to be a private university, you know, we rely on uh, very significant levels of federal government support to fuel our research mission. Um, our students are in receipt of federal financial aid assistance in the form of Pell Grants and so forth. So just by virtue of the funding, you have a public dimension uh, that is um, undeniable. And I think more than that, you know, we play an important role in, in society and um, in, um, in, in fueling um, uh, advancement. And uh, again, as I've discussed before, sites where students can come in and transcend their circumstances and, and, and so forth. So I think in, in these ways, when you understand that public responsibility, I think when it comes to things like research dissemination, for instance, you're constantly thinking about how you can use the bounty of the ideas, um, the expertise um, that you are cultivating with the institution, but to share it with the world, but in a way that recognizes um, the need to not just simply command support, but to earn support, you know, to, to, to try and inject the humility into our students and our faculty, that as much as we have formal levels of expertise that are credentialed and so forth, that there's still, um, there's still a responsibility to interact with those who may not have the same credentials and can still though bring important perspectives and questions to bear. And I think we have a duty to be responsible to uh, those uh, those citizens with whom we interact and to honor uh, these, this commitment to public service and to, and to recognize you just can't simply compel subservience or adoption of ideas. The, 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 the allegiance has to be earned. I want to go back to something you said earlier, which was your statement essentially that there's broad public acknowledgement that universities play a huge role in 
elevating people in our society. Um, I'm, I'm sure you saw this Wall Street Journal reporting, but there was a really excellent piece a few weeks back describing how there has been an increasing decline in college enrollment of, of men. Um, so you're, you're, you're seeing for the past 40 years, there's been a broad, yep. there's been a widening gender gap um, in university attendance. And it's at the point now where I think the number is like 59.5% of attendees of higher education are, are, are women. So if, if we know that at a statistical empirical level, attending some form of higher education, so not just the Johns Hopkins, the top two universities of the world, but a, a, a two-year community college, a, a four-year public research university, and everything in between, if we know that this produces economic success, furtherance for whatever we're going to call the American dream, what is driving this this gap, this this dropping out. And then the thing I add to it too is you could also argue that this is also driving the student loan conversation. Because if people had faith, and once again, this isn't just on Johns Hopkins, but if our society had faith that a college degree would give you a 2x, 5x, 10x return on your investment, the debate around debt would seem to feel a little less pressing than it feels today. So I would just love your, I'd love your thoughts on the contradiction here. So, you know, let's start and maybe work back from uh, your last point around debt and, you know, how we think about um, the um, willingness to commit to higher education and, um, and to take, if there's no um, um, uh, financial aid in the traditional sense of grants and so forth, people's willingness to uh, borrow for, uh, for their program. And you know, um, I'll confess, you know, this is a this is an issue that uh, I spent a lot of time on over the years. Uh, when I was back in Canada, um, and I was dean of a law school um, at Toronto for about a decade, we moved from a world of very low tuition into uh, for Canada much higher levels of tuition in a relatively short period of time. And this is talking about a second degree program where people who enter it by virtue of um, of their admissions requirements are already people who have had an undergraduate degree, they have some exposure to higher education, and presumably, um, and particularly in the case of a law degree, um, they know that they're going to get a significant increase in their human capital, their long-term earning potential as a result of that, uh, of that degree. And so as we, as we thought about as we were increasing tuition to be able to support a degree, a number of different program enhancements, the question was, you know, should we just simply say to everyone uh, who's, who's, who wants to attend, we'll make loans available, we'll subsidize them while you're in uh, law school. And then afterwards, if you're successful, um, you can pay them back quickly if, if financially successful. If you decide to embark on a different path um, and you want to go into public service or you want to be a public defender, then we can think about a longer payback period or perhaps we simply, as we ended up doing, uh, deciding to um, essentially relieve the debt uh, pretty pretty rapidly uh, for those students. And you know what was interesting, because um, given that we um, we were late in developing the kinds of financial aid structures you see in the United States, but what was really interesting, even the case of a second degree program that was highly esteemed within the country, as we sought to recruit students um, from um, lower socioeconomic backgrounds, the deep anxiety about taking on levels of debt to pay for higher education, even if you could, you know, go through these, you know, the, these, the uh, data that showed that they were going to be um, very, um, very um, um, capable of paying off these loans quickly, there was a deep reluctance to do so, that a lot of these students, um, and we spent a lot of time doing focus groups and working this through, were just, just not, not comfortable with the level of debt that was required. And so, you know, ultimately, we decided that it was really important that we develop a program that did have the back-end debt relief, but also particularly with a view to recruiting students from lower socioeconomic and middle-income uh, backgrounds that we had that grant assistance of, uh, available. And so I think, I think that same principle still applies today. Um, uh, and that is that for students, Students from disadvantaged backgrounds, 
um, I think first and foremost, we have a problem in a lot of students across the country, and we know this uh, from a number of different studies, from Raj Chuddy's work and elsewhere, that students just don't think that they have a place at, um, at, um, at institutions like ours. And so you have first and foremost a challenge at getting them even to imagine leaving their state, leaving their community and venturing across the country to go to, uh, to, to, uh, to university. And then, you know, I think that's coupled with um, a lot of anxiety about the, uh, about the levels of tuition and the cost of this. And that's why, you know, as much as possible, we've, we've spent so much time at Hopkins and I know so many of my peers have in making the, um, the proposition to those students as simple as possible. We want you here. If you're meritorious, if you get in, you can come and you can come tuition free. Indeed, uh, very often you will come on a full ride where we will take care of room and board. And so that um, so that this, this will be an easy transition for you. And one that uh, need not raise all the anxieties that uh, I described earlier. So, you know, I think that it's been a lot of work over the last uh, several decades that um, particularly over the last decade where universities have really sought to develop better outreach to students uh, who traditionally don't find their way to our institutions, make the financial aid proposition easier. And, 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 and again, we're seeing just the shift in our enrollment patterns as a consequence of these efforts have been quite significant. Now, you, you raised the issue earlier about gender and you know, I think I think I don't. I think that is a more complicated issue. As as we're doing this outreach to um, families who traditionally don't see easy or straightforward paths to our institutions, you know, the question is, you know, why are the female students being more receptive to our outreach than male. And I, and again, I think, you know, there's a broader literature on this in terms of what's going on in K-12 education and some of the signaling that's going on. But I, you know, and, and I, 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 I know as an educator, we are really worried about um, this trend and what um, it will mean for this country to see education and particularly higher education allocated um, disproportionately on the basis of gender and what this will mean for um, so many different dimensions that define the health of our society to have now yet a significant disparity across men and women in terms of their enrollment in higher education and what that portends for um, what happens to leaders of industry, uh, government, you know, the professions, and so forth. So, I, I, it's an important, it's an important, serious issue for us. And you're getting at the tension in terms of what you're putting forth in the book and just your general worldview, which is that on the one hand, you're arguing for universities to really step up in terms of their civic role in a really polarized country. On the other hand you are recognizing here clearly that universities are not representative of the democratic society, small d, that they're operating under. There's the um, gender balance, they're, they're um, not racially proportional, um, there are class distinctions, um, even within um, those like class distinction discussions, there's even more distinctions within that there too. So can you just get at how this should operationalize itself. Because I think the problem here would be, from my perspective, it's one thing for universities to engage, but they're not really engaging in a representative matter, manner, nor can they really engage in a representative manner. Therefore, by calling for more political, and you're not operation, you're not saying universities should be political, but in a hyperpolarized society, everything you do becomes political. Wouldn't a better answer be, at least in the short term, to further retreat from engagement in the civic sphere? I'm just curious. There's a lot of that's a lot to just really deal with. But that that was just what I was writing. That, that was the note I took when I was just reading this because it seemed that's a really sticky situation. It's difficult to get out of. So you know, 
let's start with the issue of um, what's actually happening on campuses. And you started the podcast by saying, you know, that um, it's it's um, good to be able to talk to people who are in the trenches. And so I feel I very much uh, have been in the trenches for a number of decades that I've been involved in university leadership. And, um, and for me, from the moment um, I came to the United States um, about, uh, about 16 years ago, what's been really interesting to see the extent to which the um, issue of the composition of our student bodies, and, and in particular, what you have to do in terms of recruitment and financial aid to make them much more representative of American society has been so um, so salient, and so um, so over the over that time period, and I, and I saw this when I was at University of Pennsylvania as provost, but certainly continued on um, as uh, president of Hopkins. It's been remarkable to see how starkly. Uh, um, different the composition of our student body is today than it was decades ago. Now, you know, first and foremost, you know, going back to the 70s at places like Johns Hopkins, it was the entry of women into, into our communities. And then, you know, through the 80s and 90s, much more attention to the barriers facing uh, underrepresented minorities, particularly focused on race and ethnicity. But what's been really interesting is as much as we've seen attention to those issues and, and, the, and there is a truly remarkable change in the nature of, of, our, of our campuses. Um, and I can describe them um, in concrete terms at Hopkins, but the, 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 the um, issue that has been really front and center for at least the last 10, 15 years is, is, a, is a very frank recognition of the significant barriers um, by class uh, to, um, to enrollment in university and the extent to which, even as we think about shifts in ethnic and racial composition, um, that the class issue came later um, and economic status, uh, I, I, I mean. And, and so here, you know, um, knowing that whether we're talking about the United States or talking about um, Western Europe, Canada, whether we're talking about public universities or private universities, what's so striking is to see the extent to which they're disproportionately overrepresented by people from the highest income quintile. And it's here that over the last 15 years, there's been much greater attention to, uh, to ensuring that there are more pathways to students from low and middle income families to higher education in a way certainly when I first got to the United States was not true. You know, the case of in the case of Johns Hopkins, for instance, you know, right now um, um, we would be probably about 65 percent minority students. Um, in terms of the overall student body. If you look at underrepresented minorities and East and South Asians and so forth. Um, and that's been true for the last several years. Where things have shifted dramatically and very quickly has been in terms of socioeconomic status. About a decade ago, about 10% of the student body would have been Pell eligible. Today, that's about 20, 21% Pell eligible, of course, is you know, families that are um, $60,000 of household income or less. And, and so going back to um, your question, I think we have in fact become much more representative of the diversity of America. And I think that's really important as I describe in my book, um, because to the extent that we know um, the great sort has been underway in this country and people are living within enclaves where they um, are with uh, people who share the same political affiliation, they're within the same socioeconomic uh, uh, brackets and so forth. And there's just this deep separation that and then, of course, fuels distrust and exacerbates polarization and so forth. What we've ended up with in American universities and the description I have of what's happened at Hopkins is not atypical of what's happened across the United States is, although we may not be perfectly representative of America, 
we are much more diverse, much more uh, heterogeneous than we were um, even a decade ago. And as a consequence, we become really important and interesting sites where you're bringing together people who normally, if they just stayed in their communities, would not have exposure to one another. And so that represents, to my mind, a really important opportunity to do interesting things in terms of the kinds of discussion, debate, the kind of exploration of duties of citizenship, any, any number of issues that the university grapples with, but that we can engage our students with this microcosm of America and, and try and model something different than the um, really toxic um, uh, political environment that we, um, we see outside of, uh, of universities. You know, I want to be, I want to be very careful and very specific with this point so that it comes through not as pushback, but as a problem set. So given what you just described around the diversity of the university, this is me bringing in my political background. There's a world where one could say, Hey, you know, there's, um, a underrepresented African American um, male or female from the Deep South who is now mixed in with the upper middle class kid who went to uh, Walt Whitman High School in Bethesda, Maryland, and someone who went to a private boarding school like Exeter, and an Asian American um, immigrant from California. That, that's 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 a specific sort of diversity, which is, which is incredibly important. And that mix I just gave you was not a mix you would have seen 40, 50 years ago, excluding even the gender um, the gender aspect that we referenced earlier. That that being said, um, you did a really great podcast episode with Yasha Munk that I listened to um, to prep for this episode, and you actually outlined the challenges facing American society at the time. This was a little uh, into the COVID pandemic as the following. Diminished social trust, high polarization, antipathy to government, and just a lack of compromise across divides. And I think my problem with what you're describing when it comes to Hopkins as a avenue for American society is... If you look at those four areas you identified, the racial, demographic, and class backgrounds of the folks I just listed, that's not actually where the hyperpolarization is coming from. If you look at what President Biden's electoral coalition looked like coming into 2020, this is the one he won the electoral college and the popular vote with. It was minorities, especially in the South, upper middle class college educated persons. Um, it wasn't a, a Trump voting working class white person um, from the Midwest. So what about that division in our society? Because I think you're addressing the class and racial division one in a very effective way, but I want you to address the elephant in the room in our society, which is the Trump division and how you I, think your university should think about that. So I, 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 it's a really important question. And, um, and I think, um, it's probably best to answer it by focusing on um, perhaps my too broad a categorization of uh, diversity by, for instance, socioeconomic background. You know, we have very deliberately in the, um, in the recruitment of our students sought to get America represented in the institution. Meaning that, um, you know, first of all, there's an effort to recruit from every state of the country. Um, what has changed over the last several years, particularly as we've become much more acutely sensitive to this issue of the barriers that um, deter people from coming from uh, less traditional backgrounds to universities, we've gotten better at reaching out to small communities where maybe they're only sending a few students to university each year. Um, and they may not even have a formal guidance counselor that is advising the students, but we've gotten much better at being part of broader efforts to, um, to reach out to those students and to build pathways to our institution. And so I guess for me, um, I would start off and say that, um, that I don't think this, that our campuses are uh, bereft of students who come from uh, backgrounds that are conservative, that are from rural areas, um, from, you know, from parts of the country 
where, um, you know, where there has been significant support for Donald Trump, true red states, they're represented on the campus. And so the key then, it seems to me, is how you take um, this group of, of young citizens and you give them the opportunity to you know, build their, um, their um, majors and to get the kind of education experience they want out of the university that will, that will enable them to then move on to you know, professional school or graduate work or so forth, or just right into to industry. But at the same time, I think what's really important is having them all here cheek by jowl with one another and to imagine that this is an, an opportunity that, uh, that they would not have had to be able to interact with people who effectively are strangers. And, and this is where I think that um, in so many parts of this country, particularly without mandatory national service, one can imagine that so many Americans will stay within communities, stay with, um, with people who share the same political affiliations, uh, the same value set, and never really be forced to confront uh, the complexity of the country. And given that we've got that diversity here, um, and again, it's, I, I won't say that it's perfectly representative of America. I think it's, it's but it has moved in a direction at, at, at a number of the universities with which I'm familiar, where we understand how important we are as places to, um, to start to model what I hope is a healthier level of debate and interaction that what, than what we see in our poison environment. And you can't do that without having red state representation, without conservative representation on our campuses. And I think the key thing to illustrate, and that's why I was saying I wasn't saying my previous question is criticism, because I actually agree with your broad vision. And you know, I'm out of college for a while, but I'm, I'm very attracted to what you're describing, especially when you come to your points around pluralism and debates and society. And you know, at a core level, to your point, if we're looking at the country, there's all these huge questions in front of us. Universities should really be these serious hotbeds of debate and discussion, but it, it it doesn't feel like they are. And I'm and I'm also being precise here in that I'm largely uninterested in the like campus free speech debate in the sense that oh, like if you invited a super Trumpy person to Hopkins, there'd be a protest. I mean, yeah, no duh. I mean, that's 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 particularly obvious and uninteresting to me. The part that's interesting though is I don't think anyone would describe universities, let's assume good faith here, as centerpieces for working out the problems facing our society in contrast to the vision that you're outlining here. So what should we do on that count? Because, you know, I'm not saying we should have conservative affirmative action. I'm not saying that we should be a little too literal in terms of who needs to get represented where, but how do you just think we can get to that ideal you're speaking to? Because I don't think anyone would agree that that is where we are at any level right now. So I think it's a terrific question. And, um, and I, and I think it's important to be concrete in, in responding to it. Um, you know, we know the aspiration. So the question is, can we concretize it? Is it practicable? And so, you know, within the book, um, I talk a bit about um, first and foremost, just um, the laissez-faire attitude that we college administrators have had over the last several years where we have allowed students to replicate the enclaves where they come from on campus. And so, you know, the, um, the number of universities that have moved over the last uh, several decades to allowing students to self-select their roommate before they come into university and they're doing this on social media and they're essentially looking for typically, you know, matching up across uh, characteristics that define themselves. And so, so we start off with, you know, um, what makes this experience unique is that we're going to bring together this very heterogeneous population. We're going to put students into, into the mix and, 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 and make it unavoidable that they're going to have collisions, interactions, um, with others who are different from them. And 
And if we start off and we say, first and foremost, you get to choose your roommate and you get to, you know, to replicate your, your, your community, your home environment and the community you've hailed from, I think that's a lost opportunity. So I think, you know, thinking intentionally about housing policy, dining policies, even, you know, at the level now as we're thinking about design of other public spaces on campus, we're involved in a, a project now to design a student center that, uh, that has uh, long been yearned for at Johns Hopkins. But a key theme of that student center will be how do you create spaces that will, um, will allow students to have moments where they meet um, within groups um, that might be defined and you know by their political interests or their educational interests or com you know community engagements or whatever, but then you know be um, be intentionally uh, uh, designed to have the students collide with other groups who are also meeting in that in that space, and so that again, you're just increasing the opportunities for interaction, making it unavoidable, as I said before. So I think there's a lot you can do in terms of the extracurricular dimensions of this intense four year experience that can cut against the instinct for isolation um, and for replication of the, of, of the uh, different solitudes that we see in this country. I guess at another level, one of the things that I think is um, is regrettable is the extent to which uh, we have um, found ourselves in the position often as university leaders where um, we are mediating or adjudicating disputes around um, controversial speakers and trying to, you know, when 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 a speaker on you know coming in who has very progressive views um, and might be offensive in some dimension to some, then you know saying, well, we'll have another event a week later where you'll bring in a conservative speaker and trying to get the balance through that kind of um, structure. And to me, that seems again as a lost opportunity. As I as I argue in the book. Um, I think we don't want to find ourselves as adjudicators, but as educators, where we're bringing together and modeling for the students um, debates, dialogue, where you have left and right um, um, on a number of issues uh, side by side with one another. So students can actually see the extent to which when this is done well, ideas of civic friendship can be nurtured within the university where even though you might not agree at all with the with the speaker with whom you're debating or discussing but nevertheless you remind them that you know we're we're, we're actually involved in a common enterprise and we're trying to we're trying to figure out how we make the country better stronger and even you know again trying to encourage the students to understand those places where we are just at odds with one another because we have fundamentally different priors, um, deeply different norm conceptions of the world. And where it is that um, it turns out we actually, the space between us is not as great and we actually have different empirical understandings or we have different, we've used a different logic or maybe faulty logic to figure out the implications of those views. There's lots of reasons why what on the surface seems like deeply entrenched, implacable, um, irreconcilable difference turns out actually on close scrutiny, uh, not to be as profoundly deep and different. And so it's those, it's to my mind, the role of the university, given that we have this bounty now, a much greater level of diversity and an environment where, as I'd like to, you know, to, 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 to remind people of when they ask me why I feel so passionate about universities, I say it's a place apart where, to my mind, it is reason and fact that really are the coin of the realm. And so if you combine that heterogeneity coupled with the deep commitments to fact and reason and, you know, a, a, and a, a, a resolute commitment to academic freedom and to contestation. If you put all those things together, and I think if you go out of your way to structure the interactions so that um, they're they're not as um, they're not infrequent, but much more become much more normal. That this is a way in which we debate hard issues 
that um, reflect difference. You know, in our last few minutes here, something just came to mind, which is not on my prepped question list, but could you speak about the degree to which students are adults? Because something you said that was very interesting there, and I hadn't heard it put this way, but it's actually rather obvious, is your point that too often these debates around speakers on campus, ideology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, are the university having to come in and adjudicate in these style of situations where if you look at the broader society, there isn't some greater force, especially after you're 18, that would be expected to do that. So in a sense, you're getting at a degree with which that style of administration actually can prevent the pluralism that you're speaking to. And then another thing you also just pointed out when it came to the way that students structure themselves. So whether it's everything from choosing to live together in dorms. Um, I know there are some conservative listeners who want me to ask you something along the lines of, hey, you know, what do you think about segregated college dorms between um, racial, ethnic, religious groups, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And regardless how you feel on those issues, in the rest of our society, if you want to live with just black people, you just do that. If you want to bring a speaker to your private club, you bring a speaker to your private club. And the metropolitan New York Democrats who are not at your Republican club don't really have a say. So I guess what I'm just getting at is, and I'm just, you so helpfully just articulated this is what, what is the difference between a way a student operates and just the rest of the society you're speaking to? So I, I look, you, you of course, um, can't help but be in this position and be impressed by, uh, the, um, passion, the intelligence, the achievements that your students bring to university. But um, we also shouldn't lose sight of the fact that they are here as students and we are here as educators and that they are here to grow and develop. And as much as they bring to the institution, they're, um, they're young adults and they're getting ready for for the responsibilities of citizenship and adulthood that you know that will uh, come after graduation, and and I think um, it's in that respect that that as an educator, there are times that you um, have to call out things that you think are important for the kind of um, experience, the kind of curriculum. Um, the skills that you want to see them develop and so forth. I mean, there, there's, we, we can't, we, we, as much as we honor and respect the, um, not just the right, but at least the duty of students to figure out their path forward, we still have a view about what goes into supporting them as they embark upon that journey. And, and it, again, I go back to, if we take seriously how incredibly precious and rare in this country um, it is to have institutions, which though, as you know, as we've said a number of times, may not be perfectly represented in the country, are still one of the few sites where we are bringing people together at a time when, they're, when their understandings of the world aren't wholly fixed and they're open to growth and, 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 um, and, and hunger for that kind of um, interaction. If, if we do our jobs well, I think we can help them get to a more responsible level of citizenship than if we simply say, you know, that's that that's you know, that's that's their choice. They can do whatever they wanted to come through here. And 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 that's not and that's not how we understand our obligation as educators. And I and I guess I would finally say, you know, to the extent that some might worry about the level of free choice and agency that one has um, when they come to university, if you know, there are people like me saying, and the faculty saying, well, we, we do have a view as to what we want you to do here. We, we, we call out requirements for, you know, getting a major or, you know, there are certain, certain expectations we have of the kind of experience we'll have. I guess the answer to that would be, well, there is an element of choice in the institutions you select to go to. So that, um, you know, again, students can decide to, in this country, 
um, to choose among a wide array of different institutions that will think about the kind of experience they offer differently. So it's not like it's one size fits all. And I, again, uh, think that um, we can we can articulate a set of ambitions and expectations for our student body and and um, and 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 students. Some students will say that you know um, that's not for me. You know, I I prefer to be in a place where I don't have to deal with the same kind of challenges, or I don't want to be as uncomfortable in you know in 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 um, social settings or in academic settings. I just I I know what I want. I just want to get through this experience and 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 you know that's 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 their prerogative. But that's not what I think we ought to be doing. And the last question, and it speaks to your your interest in civics and ties this back to our starting conversation around the role of universities and democracies. You've really, you did a, there was a good excerpt uh, of your book that ran in the Atlantic that I suggest everyone check out before they um, go to the book because it, it speaks to civics and the role that universities could play in um, the fact that civic engagement is incredibly low. You're seeing the high school K-12 pipeline really fail there as you illustrate. At the same time, what I find myself wondering is what is the civics baseline that the country could operate under? Because in the Atlantic piece, you make reference to the fact that the left and the right increasingly agree in the face of, once again, that K-12 drop-off, that this is an important issue. But the civics that are advanced by Ron DeSantis in Florida or Greg Abbott in Texas are quite different than, let's say, former Virginia Governor Terry McAuliffe or right. um, you know, Gavin Newsom, the uh, governor of California, would put forward. So how should we just think of that baseline in a way that doesn't just exacerbate everything? Because not to turn this into a 1619 Project discourse, but I don't think it served the project well when local school districts adopted that adopted a 1619 New York Times curriculum, probably not quite understanding that that was a politicized move in of itself. So how should we, anyone, whether you're conservative, left, right, center, how should you think of the construction of such a civic curriculum so it doesn't turn into another culture war issue? So it's not easy. Uh, we know that, um, but I, but I do think that there are several rays of hope in this domain, um, and um, and one of the most exciting one is a group of scholars um, uh, from left and right, philosophers, historians, educators, principals. Um, and um, and others involved in the Educating for America Democracy Project. And basically it's bipartisan. And this has been a group that has taken, uh, taken on, on the issue of K to 12 curriculum around American civics and is has designed a really thoughtful um, uh, roadmap for how you think about the content of American civics, which isn't just about um, skills or habits, but actually has even gone to uh, uh, the point of identifying the kind of substantive knowledge that students should have before they graduate from high school in terms of understanding core structures of government, the ideas that animated the formation of the country, where those, where those aspirations have been realized and where they haven't been. Um, and what I think is exciting about this enterprise, apart from its bipartisan character, is the fact that it still leaves scope while sending out some core elements that should be involved at all stages of a student's progress through K to 12, um, but still leave some scope to local jurisdictions to figure out how you how you how you tweak it for particular um, uh, preferences, um, values that uh, that are important to them. But it doesn't it doesn't leave you with something that a core is anodyne. It is mm -hmm. it's it's real and and um, and meaty. And so, you know, to my mind, um, if we can do that for K to 12, then I think it's also possible to imagine that this can be done at a university level as well. And again, this is where the enormous diversity and pluralism of American higher education uh, can play an important role that um, you, one can imagine individual universities uh, having the discussion, thinking about ways in which they want to um, 
embellish the understandings that students hopefully have received in high school um, and, 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 and the particular ways in which they will do that through formal curriculum or um, other types of exposures uh, to, to ideas of American democracy. And so um, I think this is, I think it's doable. And, and, um, and not only do I think it's doable, I know it's doable because we have the evidence that, that these kinds of um, collaborations are working. And, and again, at a moment where, um, as I argue in the book, where there's so much at stake in terms of the growing, not just distrust in institutions, but the whole idea of democracy and, and the importance of democracy uh, to ideas of freedom and equality that we, you know, we hold dear. It seems to me that um, it's really incumbent upon us to, to take up the mantle of saying, if this idea is important, these habits are important, then we can't just assume that through osmosis, they are going to be um, received by students. We, we have to, again, educate for them. And, um, and, 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 and again, if, as I argue in the book, the university is a bulwark institution of democracy, however individual institutions decide they want to respond to this challenge, I think it's important that they do respond. Ron Daniels, thank you so much for joining. I think this was meaty. It leaves a lot for the audience to check out. Um, I really suggest that everyone pick up their copy, as I did, of what universities owe democracy. And as a good starting point, they check out your writing at The Atlantic, Washington Post, and other venues. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for, a, uh, thanks for a great opportunity and a wonderful discussion.